question. Two questions run about an hour, hour and 15 minutes each. We'll have a break in between for a bathroom break. Uh, at some point, we might have a sandwich if you're not fasting. And, uh, and if you are fasting, we'll do it out of sight of pastor. And, uh, and then we'll uh, come back in. We'll close. We want to close with uh, 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 disruption. And so we have four different categories that we're looking at. But here's the thing. The accomplishment of a protective detail in a church setting is unusual, to say the least. You can't really protect the flock when you're asking everybody in the neighborhood to come in. We don't want to lock our doors down and shut our doors because we're here to reach our community. We're here for the dysfunctional to find function within the church. Now, you can tell I'm the preacher. He's not, all right? When he starts teaching, he's, I call him the professor. I'm the interrupter. I'll get up and say, but what I learned in this church or what I did in this church, and, and so when you see how we do this, we've been friends for 50 years now, and, uh, well, maybe not that long. Not friends, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, well, we get along well. We interact. We have been doing this a while, but I want to, just stay with me if you would. Violence, chaos, and disruption comes to church. It's not America's safe zone anymore. It's not a place where you can trust that you are not going to be impeded upon by dysfunctional people or people with a, uh, a vengeance against someone in this church, against the pastor, or against religion as a whole. So as we go through today, we're going to show you some different things. And I like to keep it kind of simple. Back in 2009, I think it might have been Mar yeah, March 8th, 2000. Boy, it's great having it back there. I don't have to look behind me. March 8th in uh, 2009, Pastor Fred Winters was killed in his pulpit. He was shot through the Bible, through the Bible by a gentleman who had been in the parking lot for two or three hours before church even started, chain smoking cigarettes, trying to get the courage to go in and kill someone. And, and, and he took down the pastor, but he also stabbed a couple of the uh, ushers and, and uh, deacons and, and, and eventually cut his own neck. You'll see, we'll talk about it later on. But at the time uh, when Fred Winters was killed in March, I had been in ministry since 1998. I spent a 23-year career in uh, the United States Secret Service, 30 years in law enforcement. I was local law enforcement before I went federal. I had guarded five presidents. I had uh, transferred around to eight different city locations and, and, and different assignments in my career. But God said, follow me. I got a different plan for you. And he called me to full-time ministry. And, and so I said, okay, Lord, I'm following you. And I moved from Seattle, Washington to Springfield, Missouri, where I was asked to take over the national movement of men, men's ministries for the Assemblies of God, over 12,000 churches. At the time, in 1998, I started on Mother's Day, ladies. And, uh, but I, at the time, Promise Keepers was really going strong, Bill McCartney, a coach, and all the guys are getting every, all the guys in, in stadiums and, and football fields, and they were all celebrating Jesus, raising their hands in glory. And, and, and so men were on the move. And, and, and so they hired me uh, knowing I was uh, called to ministry, my wife and I. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things I never expected to be at a national level so quick. I figured I'd be cleaning toilets in a church. Amen. And uh, because that's what I'd heard pastors do when they start out. You know, they start out as a janitor in the church. But uh, I had favor, amen? I uh, served for that position for seven years. And after seven years of traveling every weekend, preaching in churches all over the nation and worldwide, uh, God said, I got a different plan for you. You need to take down your walls and your borders because you have a message that's wider than, you know, just the Assemblies of God. 
And, and so I said, okay, because I, you know, I was open to anything because I was raised Episcopalian. And, and so, you know, this Episcopalian guy got so saved down in, in Alabama when I met my wife and she was raised Baptist and got saved every Sunday. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> you know, when my wife educated me on what salvation really was, it wasn't identity with the church. It was identity in Christ. And uh, so, you know, I had been in the church. I'd seen all sizes, shapes of churches. I'd, I'd been, as I transferred in the Secret Service, realized that churches meet in high schools, churches meet in elementary schools. They meet in storefronts. They meet in churches, beautiful churches like this one. They meet in small churches. They meet in mega churches. I'd been in all size categories. So, and I always seemed to get to be the center aisle usher. I don't know why, but the pastor always thought I was going to get large and get up and take a bullet for him, you know. <laughs> I didn't even take my gun to church, amen. <laughs> but uh, but I always took the offering, you know. I was always the one, hey, why don't you take the offering, put it in the bank, you know, that kind of thing. So I've been around ministry for twenty-something years, and but God said, lay it down now. I have a different plan for you. And after seven years, I decided to, that uh, God was speaking to my wife and I that we should move to Florida. We moved down to Pensacola where I grew up. I grew up down there as a, a single parent mom, uh, uh, child. My dad died when I was three in an automobile accident. My mom worked at the Navy base and raised my sister and I. And I was a juvenile. I was the only guy I know that got kicked out of the Boy Scouts. I mean, I was just a terror, you know. They didn't want me around their kids. And, uh, you know, but I, I proved wrong something that the man said to me when he told me to stay home. He says, you're uncorrigible, incorrigible, unteachable, and a bad influence. I remember sitting as an 11-year-old boy on a bed in Pensacola, the cinder block home, and we weren't rich, you know, with a, just my mom working and two kids and, and, and thinking, why don't they like me? You, you know what I'm talking about. It didn't matter that I was told these names that I didn't understand what they were. All I know is, why didn't the kids like me? And I felt an encouraging voice say, you just stick to it, do the right thing, and be who you, I've made you to be. It wasn't until I was called to ministry at age 52 that I realized that was God himself talking to me at an 11-year-old boy because he's a father to the fatherless. Now let's zip ahead. I left the Assemblies of God in Springfield and moved down. I'm still ordained with the Assemblies of God as well as the Executive Director of Church Growth International of the Americas. I'm an associate pastor of Brownsville Church in Pensacola, Florida, uh, and I travel with Church Security Insights and Champions of Honor, a national ministry to men. Uh, I am very busy, and I have a wife and three dogs, two kids, one in Chicago, one in Los Angeles, all married. Praise God. I did my job. Now it's time to play golf. <laughs> but I, I know this, that when Fred Winters was shot and killed that morning, I was in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a young man uh, that I was doing contract work with, TSA, I was doing airport inspections. TSA had been stood up after 9-11 in the agency and they were hiring contractors for me uh, and I needed help to get my ministry started, you know, by a vocational pastor. And uh, so we were doing contract work and I was there in Shreveport and Fred Winters was killed on that Sunday morning, Monday, we showed up at the airport to inspect it. And Larry Porty, a man sitting over here, that came up to me on that day and he said, hey, preacher, that's what I was fondly known as, how come you're not helping your pastors protect themselves? I said, well, I'm a preacher now. You know, I'm not a Secret Service agent anymore. You know, you are what you are created to be. And God had a perfect design on you. And all the things you went through as a combination that brings you up, that gives you life experience, that gives you who you are in ministry. No matter what you are, either lay ministry or formal ministry. And, but I didn't realize that. I started getting educated a little bit that day. Because the next morning, I kind of blew him off. I went over and had breakfast with Denny Duran, a pastor of 
big church there in Shreveport and his associate. And the first thing they asked me, hey, Chuck, how come you're not teaching us how to protect ourselves in our congregations? And I thought right then the Holy Ghost was telling me this was something that was on my horizon. So I went back that, to work that morning when we went back to the airport. I went up to Larry. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll start doing that. I'll start helping you develop it if you do it with me. And, and so I, I said, I'm in full-time ministry, but I can bring you on as a contractor, and we can do it on Saturdays and everything, but we need to really research this. Now, to talk about Larry, Larry had 25 years in law enforcement in the Secret Service, a special agent in charge of the Detroit office when he retired. He, uh, he, uh, he's still in law, law enforcement. He's trying to retire right now, but the shutdown won't let him retire, you know? <laughs> they shut down his retirement. <laughs> And I've got more work out here that I need to do, but I can't take him out of his full-time job. And he's smarter than I am. That's why he's the professor. And, uh, but Larry, has, it was a Detroit police officer. He, his father was a police officer. He has uh, been in charge of many studies while he's in the Secret Service on violence, the Columbine shootings. Uh, in the interim before he, uh, when he retired and went on to other law enforcement uh, endeavors, he was uh, teaching school and got into safe schools and teaching how to make our schools safe. And you know that's just as important as churches. And uh, it's, it's amazing to me that after the Parkland, Florida shooting, now in Florida, every school in Florida, at least in my two counties that I'm, I'm in, in Santa Rosa and Escambia, they've hardened their sites. There's only one door you can come in and out of. You got to show an ID, you got a ring doc. You feel like you're coming to church here. Amen. You got you got security in place in, in schools, and that needs to happen. Does that say that something won't happen? No. But if we can teach you a little bit more that you can take not only from here to apply here, but into your workplace, into your schools, into your family, uh, keeping you aware, and we don't need to live our lives in fear. We need to be like the Israelis, really. And, and live in awareness. They live in awareness all the time. They're always having something going on over there. So if we can learn to shift our focus, trust God, and live in awareness, that would help us immensely as we, as we uh, grow in this ministry called security in church. I really didn't think we needed security in church, but at the time, I always thought it was just kind of place to go and be safe and get between you and the Lord. But then I started seeing different things in different churches I was in. And when this guy, Terry Sadat, whatever his name is, Terry, came to that church in Marysville, Illinois, you know, he, was, uh, he just walked up the center aisle and, and started shooting. Missed the first one, misfired. He shot through the Bible, then it misfired. Then he pulled out a knife, you know. And just thinking that church, much like this church after the, Kroger shooting, the next Sunday when uh, someone got up to preach, I bet there was 90% of the church had guns in their purses, you know, and, and if you'd have pulled a gun, they'd have been shoot out at the OK Corral, you know. It was uh, uh, interesting that uh, yesterday we were talking, Billy and I, and Billy says, hey, what if our officer and, and Larry got out in the lobby and kind of shot off a couple of blanks? I said, I don't want to be in that city congregation when that happens. And just to hear the impact and the echoing of shots being fired in a closed, contained building. It wouldn't be good. But here's Terry. Terry really is the reason Larry and I joined forces. And as soon as he can get rid of his day job, uh, you know, we're going to be doing more and we've got some good plans going. But we've been doing this now since 2009 and teaching churches all across the nation. Amen. And I just got back from the Bahamas this last year as well to Miles Monroe uh, Church. Uh, now David Burroughs is the pastor, and we trained all of his people. Uh, myself, Larry didn't go. Bahamas, just me. And uh, anyway, but uh, we trained them down in the Bahamas and everything. I've been down to Peru and trained a big church in uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Berger in, in, in Lima, Peru. And they have a lot of robberies, the same as in the Bahamas. 
And, and so after I had trained in Peru, I came back, and a few months later I heard gang members came in with automatic weapons and robbed the church during a business day and had everybody underneath. Nobody was killed, thankfully, and, uh, but had everybody under their desk and took about $70,000 in cash. I'm telling you, we live in a world today where respect is not given to God. And, and, and so that is why sometimes I believe that God has raised up men like Larry and I that will have a heart for educating schools and churches on how to properly protect yourself. The paradox of church violence is protecting the congregation while ministering to those who need help. Protecting the flock while inviting the wolves, you know. We've found that every time we've seen an incident, we study every instant of violence. You know, two nights ago, or two days ago on Sunday is a shooting in Texas again. A woman was killed in the parking lot outside a Catholic church. A domestic case spilled over into church. And so, I mean, we study everything. And what we see is, is this. We have to really help those that are looking for hope. If they're looking for hope, then where else are you going to find it? Church. And so we can't just bar the doors and say, hey, me, my four, and no more. We have to have a heart for the community, but we have to have also the wisdom of God. Amen? The paradox of church violence goes that churches here, by their very nature, want to minister to those in need, but they also attract people close to the edge, people who are drug dependent, people who are... Uh, uh, mentally unstable. We saw a lot in the Secret Service between our combined uh, protecting presidents. We also investigated threats against the president and the White House and, and uh, the country and a lot of mentally ill people. And part of the gun problem, in fact, in my opinion, this is my opinion, part of the gun problem getting in the wrong hands of mentally ill people is, uh, is uh, you know, you can't put a uh, what is it, HIPAA laws prevent us from putting their names on a list to keep them from buying a gun. But then again, as we studied it, we found that a lot of guns came from their parents or came from a, uh, a, another person in the family, and it wasn't them buying them anyway. They're getting them legally, and, but they're mentally. But we have to understand in our own family situation, if you got someone going on, on, off the deep end a little bit, you know what I'm saying, call attention to it. Get help for them. The church should be a place for helping and nurturing those that we love. We have things like 12-step, celebrate recovery. Uh, in fact, our church in Brownsville, we are refocusing the whole mission of the church. It's, uh, it was a great revival. Three, three million people got saved during the revivals in the 90s in this church. But now it's down to 250, 300 people. It's ministering to the poorest neighborhood in the state of Florida. And we are there helping, and we're refocusing right now to a mission Brownsville. How are we going to impact Brownsville? You know, the church is a side thing. Everybody is called to go and be in ministry, and so that's what happens. In that, you're going to have some people that don't look like you, don't act like you, don't smell like you. They're weird, but I've seen evidence of Young men and women that have gotten loved on and cleaned up and in 12 steps and come out. And right now, uh, one woman runs the dollar store right down the street from the church. Got six kids. She was living in drugs. And I mean, so there are stories. And you can get frustrated when you're in that position and you see you're not getting help. And that frustration will turn to rage and that rage will turn to anger and and all of a sudden, you're doing things stupid. And that's not what we want to see. We're here, you'll hear more of this. See, the mission for us, you and I, is to be prepared. It says in Proverbs, a prudent man foresees the difficulties ahead and prepares for them. But the simple keep going and suffer for it. So if we're not preparing ourselves for what's ahead, we're not doing what God has called us to do. And that scripture just drives it home for me. And that's what this seminar is all about. It's going to help you understand 
when violence comes to church, why is it a cry for help? Why is it a look at, for hope and a, and a last chance? And why is it validation of their thoughts, even though their thoughts might be drug-induced and wrong? Why are they looking for the church to validate? They, this, the church is a symbol of authority. Just like the White House was a symbol of authority for the nation, and the attacks are against the government at a protest at the White House, no matter who the president is. It doesn't matter across the board. Threats are about the same all the way across. But it's the institution, and the institution of the church is something where you have threats against the church, and you don't even realize it's against the church because a lot of the mentally ill people that we have interviewed have a fixation on their Michael the Archangel, they're a messenger from God, they're hearing false ideations, they're, they're doing things that are, you know, mentally off. Not everybody, some of it is just plain stubborn, anger, rage, jealousy, theft. Some of it's just stuff that we live with today that 50 years ago we wouldn't have had to live with. Domestic violence spill over, just like the woman who was killed in the lobby of the, uh, I mean, the parking lot of the Catholic Church in Houston on Sunday. That was a domestic case, pure and simple. It wasn't against the church, but it happened at the church. Where would he find her? At church. Workplace violence. You know, where we'll, you'll have ex we'll have examples. You'll see different examples of workplace violence. Uh, you know, you'll, we'll, we'll talk about active shooter. We'll talk about what to do if you're in a mall or a business or whatever, how, you know, we have education for that in this course. And, and we, are, we are looking forward to having you interact with us in this. And then there's finally a fixation on church or, or staff members. I've kind of exhausted that, but sometimes it's not even against the pastor. Sometimes it's against Billy. He done made somebody mad, you know? The, uh, so, you know, you never know. We'll be talking about uh, the abortion doctor that was killed in his church. He was an usher. He had bodyguards, he had armored car, he had bulletproof vest, he carried a gun. But in church, he didn't have anything. He's trusting God. I trust God, too. I just don't want to meet him too soon, you know? Uh, well, I do want to, but then again, you know. We used to study in the White House. We did a study in 1964. It goes back, but it still applies. It, it, of, uh, of individuals who appeared at the White House, and subsequently we committed them for, you know, psychiatric evaluation, a 72-hour hold, to see whether or not they were a threat to themselves or others. And if they were a threat to themselves or others, then we would, you know, uh, uh, bring about ways to in, keep them uh, tr and treated so that they, John Hinckley was a good example of that. The symbol of the White House was more, very important to them. John Hinckley, who shot Reagan, I mean, the bottom line is this, he was following presidents before Reagan. He was doing things, he should have come to our attention uh, in Nashville when Larry and I were doing an advance for the president when he was there with a gun with President Carter there. You know, there are people that are really kind of off, and you can recognize them. And they might sit down, you know, next to you in church and everything, and you know they're a little bit off. Well, tell somebody. Let somebody get a hand to help them, not kick them out. You don't want to kick people to the curb. What you want to do is find out how you can make them better than they are today. Amen? I'm preaching. <laughs> that fixation on the White House, see, is defined as an fixation is a, defined as an intense or obsessive preoccupation with a person, activity, location, or belief to the point it impacted many aspects of their lives. You'll see when the, after an incident happens, the police will go in or the federal agents will go in and they'll have all kind of writings drawings, you'll have things that should have been telltale signs that person needed help. But it got to that point of bam. Murder doesn't come to church every day. 
lost and troubled people do. They may be depressed, paranoid, mentally ill, suicidal, thinking of murder and possibly armed. I have a group of men that I teach when I'm there uh, on Sundays in, in, in Pensacola and uh, before church and everything, and one's a state trooper, and, and he was been uh, in pain, Pastor. He was like you in an automobile accident in his, in his trooper car, and he had back pain, neck pain. And just out of the blue one day, he said, you know, I wonder what it would be like to stand in front of a 18-wheeler and just end it. Would you know? And I said, whoa, wait a minute, Charles. We need to talk. I said, that's wrong thinking. you got too many people that love you right here. There's no pain that can take that. And he's right with God, but he's just thinking wrong. Sometimes some of the medications they give you for pain take you to the wrong place. So you have to be able to recognize it. The threat might be right inside your church. We don't want to be another statistic, another nightly news story. We don't want to have that happen. That's why Larry and I are committed to helping law enforcement, uh, churches, uh, schools, business organizations on how they can properly and effectively, you know, protect their in operations. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Nehemiah was a guy after my own heart. He was a bodyguard to the king. You know, here's a guy had it made in another nation. He's serving the king. It's kind of like Larry now out there serving the president of the United States at the White House. But here's the thing. You know, he had it made, but he had a heart for his homeland. And when he found the information that his land was in trouble and disgrace and, 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 and it was the, the wall was being broke down, and, and amen, <laughs> that preaches right now. Anyway, but, but I mean, he went back. He, to see, the wall breaking down in Israel at the time was a symbol that their faith had been undermined. They had been living in the world. Do you know churches can live in the world? You can see them failing all over the United States. But the walls had fallen down around the, the holy city because they weren't being paid attention to. You know, so Nehemiah was a guy who, he didn't big fanfare go in and say, I'm the king. He went in and got a bunch of men, surveyed what the damage was, said, what do we need to do to fix this? Because guys are about fixing things. And so Nehemiah prayed, and he told them to pray to our God. Then he posted a guard day and night. They had a shovel in one hand and a, and a sword in the other. He made families go to the lowest point of the wall. Families, not men. The men, their wives, their daughters, their sons. Families, because what man's going to run away and leave his family at an exposed place? That was very smart thinking. The church is where we need to really gather our families together and start being a family to one another. Nehemiah knew that if he rebuilt the wall, he would rebuild the foundation of teaching, of honoring God. God honored him. So we do this as a teaching, uh, I do it from a biblical side more, you know, because that, I've been doing that almost as long as I've been in law enforcement. But, uh, and, and I'm going from here to Rochelle, Illinois, in a snowstorm, to uh, a Road to Glory conference and, and preaching on the favor of the Lord. This is a year of favor. 2019 is a year of favor. Receive that anointing. But today we're here to take care of God's business that he laid upon Larry and my heart, and that is Secret Service agents. Who are we? Well, you can see by the picture, we, we walk around side of limousines during the inaugural. We protect the president. We're the guys that you don't see. We basically just kind of try to blend in. We really rely heavily on local law enforcement and, and, and other agencies to accomplish our mission because communication, communication, communication is the key to success. We are very effective in what we do. We're very effective in our criminal cases in what we do because we knew 
that if we don't hurry up and finish our criminal investigations, we'll have to leave them for a month when we go over to Middle East with one of our protectees or go out on trips and everything. So we had to really have a bipolar type of career, one of investigations and one of protection. But the best protective agent was a criminal investigator. There's something about seeing and observing. You know, Jesus said, watch and pray, not bow your heads, close your eyes. He said, watch and pray. And for me, I mean, my, I'll get going churches, and I'll be, they'll be, you know, you know, in, in, in the zone, and, and I'm looking. And they wonder why I'm looking at them. I, I'm praying. I, I really am. I, I'm, I'm focusing on God, but I'm also aware of the enemy. We have to live in awareness. You know what I found out? A lot of them are looking, too. They're looking. They want to see who the heathen is. Amen? But uh, I, I, I know this, that the Secret Service gave me good basic training for church security, and the ministry has helped institute that, and we'll be, I'm the interrupter. I'll be jumping up and down today and as we go through this. But the Secret Service gave Larry and I both a foundation of, of understanding violence. And what we have to do is remember this, our main key th point, harden your sight, control your access. Understand to be proactive, not reactive. Reactive 911, they're shooting inside here. Proactive, doors are locked. He's on the outside. I was blown away, Pastor, by the changes that have been made since that incident when that man came up to this door. He meant harm, but it was turned around by one man's thinking and an agreement with his pastor made changes here to make you safe. And that's a teachable moment for us as we take it. Trust me, we're going to be talking about y'all and talking about y'all and talking about y'all at every place we go. Larry's already taking pictures of your sanctuary, you know, because uh, we just, we're just amazed. And the history of this church, 185 years old, praise God. Praise God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to introduce my friend now, Larry, Larry Porty. Like I said, Larry was a Detroit police officer. He was a Secret Service agent. He's done these studies. He's, he's always looking for all the research. There's no incident that I don't get an email from him saying, hey, look at this. This is interesting. Maybe we ought to use it. Every time we put this PowerPoint presentation together, I, I go to his room the night before because I know he's changed it 50 times. He doesn't really want me to have it by myself because that way I'd say bye, Larry, and I'd go teach it, you know. <laughs> but uh, but I want you. I just I think a lot of him. He and his wife Mary. Hopefully he can get retired. He doesn't play golf, so he can help me finish the book that we're writing. Amen. Larry Porty. My interrupter here. I'm the guy that tries to keep us on time. <laughs> but I can tell you a little story that every time we do one of these, every Saturday morning we'll meet for breakfast, and he'll say good morning as they sit down at the table, and then he'll say, you got to watch your mouth for the rest of the day. Well, after 40 years in law enforcement, that, that, that's a challenge sometimes, so I, I understand that. And then he says, make sure that I don't talk too long. So in the beginning, I'd go, then I start, <laughs> none of it works. So, so what I told him this morning is, let your conscience be your guide. And what did he do? He went 40 minutes. 40 minutes. <laughs> There's two things I say every time I start one of these things. Is, don't you feel it's like really odd that here we are in beautiful Kentucky on a rainy day to talk about church violence? I don't care where you came from. I don't care what religion you came from. The, the fact that we're sitting in here talking about violence at churches just blows me away. And, and, and it does every time I play with these 
presentations and I add slides and shift slides and make sure he doesn't have the same, my program, but um, it, it's, just, it's just so hard to take. And the second thing I always say in the beginning is, and I use this one slide, but it doesn't really fit here. It doesn't fit here at all. Welcome to It Can't Happen Here. I use that a lot because 99% of the places I go to, people don't think it's going to happen to them. Well, I mean, I get in my car today, and I, I don't expect I'm going to be in an accident. Uh, I've, been, I've been gone from my home in Michigan for a night. I, I certainly hope nobody broke into it. But it can't happen here. You just went through it. It almost happened here. So you're a lot farther ahead than most people that we talk to because you know it can happen here. You almost had a terrible situation here. I think it's over there. So when we first started, uh, well, I, I used, uh, Chuck said I belong, uh, I was involved in a number of studies with the Secret Service on violence, targeted violence, why do people get violent? It started off with why did people attack the president? Why did people attack the White House? Why did, uh, uh, and then later on it became a school thing after Columbine, they would go back and do another study and we looked at Columbine and, and all that kind of stuff. So I dragged a lot of that background and knowledge into these first few church sessions. But the more and more we talked to people and the more and more of the research we did, it's hard to talk a lot about behavior because you don't know what you're gonna, what's going to come in here. So we have now gone more to the security part of it. I'll talk behavior. There'll be a few slides in here about behavior and what makes people violent. But we're going to talk a lot about security because the reason that we do that is because you don't know who's coming through your door. I mean, I understand it's a church family and you know each other. But there's people in here probably every week that you don't know, may not know, uh, maybe knows a person over here, but you don't know them over here. I mean, so you don't know who's coming through your door. And that's why we, we've shifted now more to the security part of it and then try to blend in a little bit of behavior too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you a quick overview of what I want to cover. And I've got to catch up uh, <clears throat> piece by piece. So, the first, so what we're going to talk about is what we've seen in school violence over the last maybe 10 years. And there's a lot of examples. Some churches say, you know, maybe you should cut down the examples. You shouldn't do as many. And I go, you need to see this. You need to know What's, what, what, what we're seeing around the country. I think, I think you need to see it and help you think about it. And then secondly, we're going to talk about what have we learned. I'm going to talk a little bit about the behavior thing, a little bit about the, uh, the threat management and targeted violence. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm going to talk about what have we learned about violence that we've seen at church. And I'll, and I'll give you uh, the f number one is, you know, the attacks always, usually, always start. I shouldn't say always, that's 100% usually start after the service has started. I mean, it doesn't surprise any of us, does it? But when we're trying to think about what we can do to craft a plan, there's a number of things we should talk about that we see, and that's number one. It starts after the service. Then we're going to talk about, uh, from there we're going to move on to some of the things that we bring forward here about controlling your access to your, to your building. You guys do a great job here. The prevention piece. And then the planning piece, not only the planning of the, where the cameras are and how we're going to open up the doors, but the, the other planning piece is what do we do if we had some type of emergency in here? Now, obviously, you know, we've been talking about shootings and violence, but that's not the whole deal. You know, what do we do if we have a, a person just grab their chest and roll out of the pew? What do we do? How do we get somebody here right away? You know, what, what do we do if we have a fight? You know, what, what do we do if, if you show up and uh, there, there's a fire here? So thinking about having a critical incident plan, you know, to look forward to something that could happen. So I'm sort of jumping myself. I said planning, but it's we got to be ready. You know, if there's something that happens to this building today where you can't have service tomorrow, do you just call it off? Or do you have maybe a plan to go somewhere else? Somewhere else in the building, if it's available to you, maybe a place down the street. I've seen churches go to hotels and... and uh, rent banquet rooms and things like that. Just have a plan. Next, we're going to talk about disruption. Um, you know, in today's uh, politically charged world with all the different place, things coming from all over the place, uh, uh, disruption at church has become more and more common. And we're just going to roll through a couple things that we've seen, that we have some video that we can show you, and a couple plans that we have offered uh, churches. 
So let's start with what have we seen first? What, what have we seen at the churches? Now, I divide them into six, ca six categories. Crime that comes to church, you know, not, not really direct at any of you or at your church. It just comes to church. A uh, visitor, a visitor that comes that uh, causes a problem, a member. You know, we, think we, we, we church family, we love our members, but, you know, people sometimes don't always get along, get a little disgruntled, get mad at each other, it festers. It's human nature. Then we talk about domestic violence. Uh, Chuck brought that up, uh, the shooting the other night in uh, Houston. Domestic violence f flows into church violence because that's where I can find that person that left me, be it a wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. If my estranged wife moved out and I didn't know where she was at, or I couldn't go where maybe she's living, I can't get to her at work, I can't get to her at school when she drops the kids off because there's always a school resource officer sitting there. I can't get to her at the courtroom, in the, at the court building because she's got an attorney there and there's cops in and out of the building and I can't get to her. Where can I get to her? I can get to her here. Because she comes every day, every Sunday at 10 o'clock, and she sits, you know what, she sits in that third row at the end. That's known. And when they get desperate, they'll come here. So domestic violence spillover in church is a big deal. Next is hate crime. You were very close to a hate crime just a few months ago. And then lastly is workplace violence. Again, some of that interpersonal relationship that may go south within the church family, and it actually results in violence at church. All right, so what do we got that comes to church? First one, I'm going to go through, I'm going to pick it up. So Richmond, California, church service going on. Everybody's up singing. Three guys walk in in the back, hoodies up, kids under 20. Hoodies up, they walk in, they go that way, and they go up, and then there's another aisle that comes over here, another aisle over here, and they come up over here. And guess what? They find what they're looking for. Gang fight, gang brawl, gang whatever. And they pull out their weapons, and they start shooting at the two guys in the church right here. And we're thankful that the two young guys in church live but we're very, very thankful in that spray of bullets that a whole bunch of people didn't get hurt. Uh, Chuck mentioned this. This is the. Uh, I'm gonna, this is a. Uh, uh, this was an infamous uh, abortion doctor. Like he said, he was uh, well known. They demonstrated against all the time. He had uh, his. Uh, uh, office looked like Fort Knox, uh, armored, uh, door, you know, bars on the doors. He wore a vest. He carried a gun. He had an armored car. He had a driver. He had uh, guards in, in, all over the place. But this guy on the on the very right side here, Mr. Raider, he decided to start following this guy around. He found out on Sundays the doctor was an usher at this church, and the doctor drove himself. The doctor didn't wear a vest. The doctor didn't carry a gun. He just was everyday usher. And they picked out a Sunday, and they walked in, and doors close. Church starts. He's in the back collecting the announcements and bulletins and stuff, and he walked in the back and killed him. So those are two examples of crime that just comes to church. It has no bearing on your church. It just came to church. And, of course, we've got to be aware of that, too. So let's talk about some of the violence we've seen that come from members and visitors. This is, uh, I mentioned a minute ago, you know, there's churches that will actually go to hotels and rent banquet uh, rooms until they get their place up and running or until the church is planted or whatever, and this is one of them. The Living Church of God, it was in Milwaukee, large uh, uh, banquet room in a Sheridan hotel. <coughs> uh, trouble between the church leaders and this gentleman who wanted to be a church leader, wanted to be part of the growth of the church and uh, uh, wasn't going right, bad blood became disgruntled, got worse, and everybody's picking sides, and you know how it goes. It doesn't take long before you're going to separate this church from this side and that side over incidents that, uh, you know. So he, uh, he walked in after the service started with a large capacity handgun, and he killed seven people to include uh, the lead, some of the leaders of the church, and four others were wounded, came in after service started, from the back, went right to where the people were sitting. And he knew that they sat in the back corner, the, the church leaders, while the service was going on. And then he left, excuse me, and he left, 
uh, he went back home and he killed himself. So it's always that, well, what are you thinking? I can't, I got no way to ask. And it's hard to really figure out how people get that way. I mean, I'm, I'm, right now I'm playing like Monday morning quarterback. I think this is what happened, but he's not here to ask. I, I can't pick his brain to ask him how this happened. I mean, that would be really helpful for guys in the kind of stuff that we do, but we don't have it. Next, this was uh, just last year. Actually, it's uh, a year and a half now. Uh, Manuel Sampson uh, used to attend this church in, in Antioch, Tennessee. Uh, he pulled up. Service was already going. Matter of fact, service was almost over. And the poor woman that was leaving early came out the door, and he shot and killed her as he came out the back door. And then he went inside from the rear, service still finishing up, and started to shoot in the main aisle. This is another one. We were so fortunate. The poor woman outside was killed. Inside, there were people hurt, but nobody, was, nobody else was killed. And it was, uh, there's this quick, uh, uh, actually CBS did a really nice piece on this story, and I sometimes think it's better for you to watch these things than just listen to me all day. So I'm gonna play this real quick here. The FBI opened a civil rights investigation into the deadly shooting at a church in Nashville over the weekend. The suspect is 25-year-old Emmanuel Cadega Simpson. He is in police custody today after shooting himself yesterday by accident. Nashville police say that Sampson killed one woman in the parking lot and wounded seven other people. Sampson is a legal U.S. resident who came here from Sudan back in 1996. Church members are now praising an usher who confronted the gunman. Errol Barnett is outside the Burnett Chapel Church of, Tri of Christ rather, in Nashville with the latest on this story. Errol, good morning. Good morning. Authorities are still searching for a motive which drove Samson to attack churchgoers at this otherwise peaceful house of worship that witnesses say he attended in the past. They also say the ordeal began just before 11.15 Sunday morning as church services were being let out. You can only imagine the kind of horror that unfolded inside of this church. Police say Samson drove this blue SUV up to the church, left the engine running, and got out with two pistols, his face partially covered with a mask. They say he then shot and killed Melanie Smith, a 39-year-old mother of two. She was a caring woman who loved God, according to her daughter, Brianna. Everybody's looking for why, why, why. There's no understanding evil. There's no understanding hate. Samson allegedly then entered the church and walked down the aisle of the main sanctuary, shooting as he moved. He hit and wounded six people, including the church pastor, before he was confronted by 22-year-old usher Caleb Engel. Police say Samson pistol-whipped Engel, but then accidentally shot himself during the scuffle and fell to the ground. This guy came, I'm fighting with him, I'm tackling him down. This witness, who later tended oh to her pastor's wounds, says Engel jumped in sure. as Samson continued to fire his weapon. And he was shooting, and then he stand in the pulpit, and he started shooting more. Injured from his struggle with Samson, authorities say Engel went outside to his car to get his own registered gun, then went back into the church to stand guard over the wounded shooter until police arrived. Mr. Engel saved countless lives here today. He is, uh, at the end of the day, the hero in this because we think this uh, could have been uh, much worse in terms of death. Samson has been charged with one count of murder with additional charges pending. As for the man who tackled the gunman, he issued a statement saying he actually doesn't want to be labeled a hero. He says that label should be reserved for the police, the first responders, and the doctors who have helped and are helping everyone involved. Charlie? Thanks, Errol. The FBI opened his... You know what I'm saying about how fortunate they have come out in the main aisle and just start blasting away and, and we only had one person that was killed? But the, the daughter, you just can't understand hate. I mean, you, it, that, that's what this is. You just can't put a, your finger on what this true hate is. Uh, this next uh, is, uh, this is the only woman that I can find that came in shooting at a church. Now, there's certainly been disruptions and there's been fights and things like that. But uh, she, uh, she had some mental illness issues and she went with her mother to prepare the communion table at church. And uh, the minister came in, they had a little chat, and uh, out of nowhere she pulled a gun out of her purse and killed the, um, her mother and the minister. And she had just been uh, released from uh, the mental health hospital on Friday. This took place on Sunday. Why? So, why? Next. 
Well, this didn't result in any kind of, nobody got hurt here, really. But it's this odd kind of stuff that comes to church. This guy, David, uh, in the middle of a Sunday session, stands up, pulls out a weapon, and points it at the minister, and says, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you, everybody in here. They were fortunate enough, they sort of talked him down, they sort of got him and took him out. But later on, the minister went in the back where the police were coming to pick him up, and he looked at him and go, I know this guy. The night before, the Saturday before the service, this guy was sitting on the front porch of that little church there, right there, and he was cutting himself. In the forearm, you know, cutter. And he was, when the blood was thick enough, he took it, and he walked up the steps, and he rubbed it on the door. Gross? Yes. That's a clue. For me, that's a clue we got something wrong here. And uh, th thankfully, that was just a BB gun. Another individual, mentally ill, Facebook threat. Obviously, Facebook threats uh, from the time I used to work in the Secret Service, there was no Facebook then. Obviously, Facebook is everywhere now. It's consuming our lives. And the threats that come on Facebook, th there's quite a few of them. This guy made a threat against his church. He was going to bring a machine gun to church because he felt that the church had kept his deceased wife's body in the basement of the church and did not bury her when she had died. He's got a problem. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. Another one. No idea why this guy targeted this church. He started mailing threatening letters to the church. After a while, he started throwing live ammunition in the mail that he sent to the church. You imagine if you open up your mail and a couple live bullets fall, fell out of church. That would sort of shake you up a little bit. And then what finally gave, they finally put a camera up, and what they found him doing is he'd show up at 6 a.m. in the morning before anybody got there, and he'd take the, flip, the flipper on the uh, mailbox of the, the door, and he'd take pepper spray, and he'd shoot pepper spray inside the church. Why? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But they finally caught him. This one is another one nobody got hurt, and it's sort of funny, but it's not funny. Guy walks into church from the back after service starts, sits in that back pew where this gentleman's standing, where the minister's standing right there, with a big old pit bull on a leash. I don't know about you, I really don't like pit bulls. I know there's dog lovers out here, but I really don't like pit bulls. And, uh, and then, you know, the dog was fine, he was on the leash. And then he took the leash off. And then what does the dog do? What's the dog do when the leash is off? He starts walking around. So yeah, I guarantee if you had a dog back there and we took the leash off and he walked this way and he walked up here, he pretty much freaked everybody out walking around. Big, big dog. So it's stuff like that that comes to church. We bring these kind of things up to you as all the different things that we see that you got to start thinking about that could happen at a church. Oops, wrong one. All right, co-worker. Workplace violence at church. Sounds odd. Happens. Franciscan monk, brother. Daniel Montgomery was transferred from a church in Cleveland to a church in Indiana. Archdiocese decided to move him. He got into an argument with the pastor he was working for. It got really ugly. He went out and got a gun, and he came back, and he shot and killed the pastor who had to tell him you had to move. And then he set fire to the rectory. They didn't know the pastor had been shot until the autopsy uh, and when they found the body after the fire. Pennsylvania, two ladies, uh, part-time administrative help at the church, uh, become jealous of each other. Uh, the lady on the uh, left was uh, the newer one. This lady here had been here quite a while at the church. She got jealous of this one, thinking that uh, the minister is paying too much attention to that one and giving her too many breaks on, you know, coming in late and not doing her work and, you know, how it goes. And so one day at church, nobody's there but these two. Mary Jane Fonder walked in with a gun while the lady was working on her typewriter. She shot her in the back of the head, killed her, left. It was an unsolved case for months and months. This happened in February. 
It wasn't really uh, solved until spring, like May. And what had happened was, I mean, there was nobody there. There was no cameras. There was no access control. There's no alarm records. There's nothing. And uh, so the police were stymied by what it was. Uh, and then in May, after the weather had broke and the ice was gone and things like that, uh, a young kid pulled his revolver out of a stream behind the church, all rusted up. It was registered to Mary Jane Fonder. They do the, you know, the forensic thing and the bullet matches, and, and that's how they finally solved the case. This is where a priest was murdered. This is a story, I mean, there's a quick, uh, well, I'm gonna play the video first, and I'll let you. A New Jersey grand jury has indicted a church's longtime janitor in the fatal stabbing of the parish's priest. The indictment handed up Tuesday charges Jose Feliciano with murder, robbery, and hindering apprehension. Prosecutors say Feliciano stabbed the Reverend Edward Hines 32 times in the rectory kitchen during a robbery last October. Feliciano had worked for the St. Patrick's Parish in Chatham, New Jersey for 17 years. He's being held on a million dollars bail. Brian Thomas, the Associated Press. He worked there 17 years. His kids went to the school. He had kids in the grade school. New priest. New priest is thinking, you know, uh, people being around our kids, we should name check them, make sure we don't have any problems. They ran a name check. This guy had a record, and it caused a riff, and he was worried he was going to get uh, fired, so he uh, staged this robbery and wound up killing the priest. And this one always amazes me. Um, this is the, uh, the Vatican Swiss Guard. Uh, I think you have too. I've been to Rome and I've worked with the Vatican Swiss Guard and they dress a little funny. But you know what? They're, they're the real deal. They're a very professional outfit, well armed, well trained. They do a really good job. They dress funny. But here's the problem between a supervisor on the Swiss Guard and a subordinate. You know, you, I mean this is the classic workplace violence. You gave me a bad evaluation, you held me back. And, and sure enough, you wound up killing them. Let's go into domestics. You know, you really can't, uh, you, you can't even th to, to think about the domestic violence thing. I mean, the, the Sutherland Springs shooting last, well, actually a year, a little bit more than a year ago in Texas was a, is another. It's a domestic violence case. He was in there to kill his mother-in-law. That's what it's all about. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Killed 26 people, another 20 injured. James Minter, interesting about this particular case is his girlfriend and baby and her parents walked into church, greeted the minister at the back door and said, hey, good morning, how you doing? Hey, we just want to let you know James might come to church today. We're having a problem with James. I guess they weren't living together. And we know James has a gun and he might bring a gun to church a clue, do something, right? They didn't. So you imagine if I'm, if I'm the minister and the door opens and I see James walk in, my eyes would get about like this big, uh-oh. And the family was sitting like right up here where Chuck's at. He walks all the way up, hand in the pocket, all the way up. I'd be panicking every second, every step. And sure enough, he gets right here and he turns and he starts shooting. He shot his girlfriend. She survived. The baby was hit. Baby survived. Preacher comes running down and he gets shot. So the teaching part of teaching part of this lesson is if they tell you somebody might be coming with a gun, it's time to call the real police. I used to do it. I would never ever think badly about getting a call like that. It's like this is what that's what the police are there to do when you start talking about weapons. Garcia, this is very similar to the shooting from uh, the other night in uh, Houston. Uh, broke up with his wife, found out the wife had a new boyfriend, and now the wife was taking the boyfriend to uh, the church that he attended all these years with her. And uh, when they came out of the church and walked to the car, he uh, sort of ambushed them and, and killed them both. Joseph, this was an arranged marriage in California didn't work. Wife left. Joseph got the feeling that there was a church in New Jersey that was assisting. This is something you got to think about as a church family. If you get too close or people may perceive you're assisting somebody, that could be a problem. 
thought that the, ch the church in Jersey was assisting him and, and, and keeping them apart. This guy travels back to New Jersey, shows up after service starts from the rear, hoodie up, and comes walking in and, and finds her and sh shoots and kills her and the person that was sitting next to her. My biggest fear with the domestic things in church, in the, in the building, is when they start blasting away, you don't know where all those bullets are going. I'm sure none of these people are like marksmen. You know, you get fearful of where are all the bullets going. It's a scary looking dude. Agree? He had a problem with his father. His father cut him off, wouldn't support him anymore, wouldn't help him anymore. He just had enough. And uh, he showed up at church. Dad sat in the back aisle. Every Sunday, for years and years and years, he walked in, came through the door, took about two steps, shot his father in the back of the head, and ran out. Fortunately, his father lived. We Lee, Facebook threat, he and his wife having problems. They split up. She works at a, uh, uh, one of these mega casinos that have a church on site. And uh, he makes a Facebook threat that he's coming in there and he's gonna shoot up everybody at, at uh, the service, the next service at the casino. Joshua Kilchrist, Facebook post again, threatened to kill the pastor, other church members. His relationship with the girlfriend broke up. Girlfriend wanted to be more involved in church. Not only Sunday, she wanted to go Wednesday night service. She wanted to get more involved. He didn't like that. The whole thing started to fall apart. So this was his way to get even, was to post on Facebook that he's going to come in and kill members of his church. Let's talk about an insider threat, something that comes from the inside. We talk, we're going to talk about workplace violence between people, but this is sort of a little bit different on insider. This one here, let me ask you, has anybody ever heard of this, where a guy put arsenic in a coffee pot at a church? You heard about this? It was a number of years ago. Small church, small church, under 100 people, right? Sure. 70 people. They've been around for 100 years. And they even, they didn't have a full-time minister anymore. They would go, my side will cover it this week, and your side will cover it next week. And they can't, co they can't cooperate, they can't get along. One of the uh, older folks in the uh, congregation passes away, let's say, and then his side of the church says, we want to donate this beautiful table that was left over from his home uh, as a communion table. And the other side's going, no way. And they're going back and forth over a stupid communion table. So this individual here, Mr. Bondison, shows up. He's responsible for making coffee, bringing cookies in for the after service, you know, um, get together. And he puts arsenic in the coffee pot. Two people died within a couple days. And another 14 who were also poisoned survived. And the funny thing about, and that's not funny at all, but the, the unusual part of this is, this is right after sort of 9-11. Uh, you know, Homeland Security is working now to have antidotes for different uh, chemical agents that we were fearful of back then. Remember how fearful we were of anthrax and all this kind of stuff? Well, they had these antidotes sent to all the state capitals, probably the state police, state patrol, whatever. And by having that arsenic antidote available, only a few miles, if not that far away, they saved these people's lives. They say arsenic is one of the worst poisons that uh, you could ever use. And the other interesting thing is, the third per this says three people died, the third person died just two years ago. He suffered all those years where they couldn't flush that out of him and it finally caused his life, caused him to lose his life, and his death certificate, you know, brought up this uh, death by uh, arsenic poison, poisoning. You know, uh, y'all want some coffee? <laughs> I think I'd fast at all, what do you think? <laughs> Larry found this book, he sent it to me and made me read it. Uh, I don't like to read books. I let my wife read them and tell me about them. And, uh, but uh, when I read this book, I did read it. It was page turner. And, 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 and I thought about how many churches I've been in 
where there was a battle going on between two families in the church and their controllers. They know what's right for the church and their way is the right way and the other way is the wrong way. And some of this can build toward division in a church. This church was actually around since the 1700s. It was uh, 70 people then too. You know, didn't do much growing up in Maine. And, uh, but it's unusual that arsenic in a coffee pot after church and everything because one, he had a mental problem. And he heard all the bickering, you know, over the years, and he finally acted on it. They uh, had an investigative reporter that really tracked it down and, and I think finally, you know, put the final piece in. But Larry's bringing about a good point in, in churches and everything is that we need to really uh, be compassionate toward one another and not spike the punch, as they say. All right. Go ahead, Larry. That was, that was an interruption. Next. Uh, the next uh, slide up there is a lady out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was in the nursery. She uh, uh, decided that uh, she was going to go to a church down the street and steal a kid. Uh, she got there early. First parent walked in with the kid. I don't know you, and decided not to leave the kid. And so this lady moved, and she went to another church. And she walked into the second church, and there were already too many church workers there that didn't know her. So she decided to leave. And then she went back to her church, where she's actually a member of the the, the church nursery. And she stole a one-year-old little girl. She's gone about four hours with the little girl. The church had uh, cameras. Uh, and they were able to track, and of course they knew who she was because she was a member there, and they tracked her down pretty quick. So, uh, I don't know if this picture's coming out, but this is what the little girl would look like with full head of hair, and this is what happened that afternoon. They, she cut her hair, she dyed it, changed her clothes, all within three or four hours. So as they dig into this a little farther, this lady used to work for a grocery store, large grocery store, like a, it's a, um, you guys got Myers down here? Myers grocery store? like a Myers big store. And uh, she worked there but got fired. She got fired for stealing. What do you think she was stealing? Diapers, baby food, baby clothing. So um, this is something that, I mean, this is every church's worst nightmare to think about something that could happen in a nursery. It's the worst. Uh, I, I had planned to bring down, l last week, I had found a uh, civil suit against the church outside of Detroit uh, claiming that their uh, five-year-old was uh, molested, uh, being told to use the restroom alone without a, uh, an adult. And they never found who did it. Forensically, they determined she was molested. And this lawsuit is about 12 or 14 pages. You read it. Uh, it makes the hair stand up on the back of your head. And I wanted to bring copies down. So, I mean, every church should read this. I mean, you've got to take this nursery stuff serious because... The lawsuit that came out of this is, is it's just terrible. I, I, you, how, would, how could you even go to court to try to fight something like this? And what I might do is send it to Billy when I get back uh, next week, because I did forget to bring it. This gentleman was a church choir director. Now, he got arrested for maybe having a little bit too much to drink, a DUI, and they asked him to leave. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not here to judge if that was right or wrong, but they asked him to leave. And, of course, his response was to come back and make threats and to uh, start stalking certain church staff members, following them home, driving by at night, leaving notes, things like that. Psychotic visitor, hate-filled attacker. It's one of the worst shootings we had before the one in Texas in 1999. Wedgwood Baptist Church down in Texas. This guy went in there during a teen rally, opened up, came through the back door. There was nobody there. You're going to want to talk about this, right? Okay, well, why don't you just talk about it? You want to interrupt? I'll just let you interrupt. I'll take the power away from you. I kind of feel like I contribute something, you know, but oddly enough, this church, I mean, the, 
Larry Ashbrook came in during a youth event. Now, no security, no adults in the lobby, nothing, and they're doing a youth thing with pyrotechnics, the whole, you know what I'm talking about, what they do nowadays. Got a young 16-year-old, he's got a camera, he's filming everything, you know, and, 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 and this guy comes in shooting with a rifle, kills seven people. He, one of the people he killed was the guy shooting the video. And the video's last thing was a bullet coming into the camera itself. Oddly enough, the pastor of that church on the Sunday after the shooting up in Illinois that we started with, where the pastor was shot through the Bible, he was good friends with that pastor. He came up and he was the one that preached that, that next service the following Sunday where 9,000 people had guns in the audience, you know. And uh, so, I mean, it's just a small little tip, tidbit there. The, uh, did you have more to say on that one? No? He keeps getting my belly in. Don't do that. Put a slimmer version. Uh, this, <laughs> Matthew Murray, I'm going to start with this, then you can clean it up. In December 2007, New Life Church in, uh, in, in Colorado Springs, Matthew Murray was part of a YWAM. You ever heard of YWAM, Youth with a Mission? He was part of a YWAM outreach in uh, Denver. His uh, parents were uh, Assembly of God deacons in their church in, in, uh, in Denver. And uh, he got kicked out of YWAM. And uh, kind of a signal like I got kicked out of the Boy Scouts, you know. You don't get kicked out of YWAM unless you've got problems. But on the night before church, on Saturday night, they were having a Christmas party, and uh, he came in and killed, shot and killed two people, was it, Larry? Uh, that night, and then fled. One of the security uh, detail of the New Life Church was a big church in Colorado Springs. Uh, he uh, was, uh, she was uh, listening on the radio and heard about it, so that morning she came armed and to the church. Turns out he went down to that church the next day, showed up, and Larry's gonna do more detail, killed two 16-year-old girls in the parking lot, sisters, and, and then went in the church and was uh, uh, shot someone else before the female uh, police officer, uh, security person, uh, shot him in the leg, I believe, and then he committed suicide. Now, this was Ted Haggard's church who had a big scandal about uh, homosexual relations between him and young men. He left the church in disgrace. Another pastor came. He'd only been there 90 days. He had Jack Hayford, which is a big four-square church pastor out in California, speaking that morning in the service. There was over 900 people in another room down the hall from where he entered. Uh, in the pre-service before they went in the services. Jack Hayford and the pastor went up to the, his office to have a bowl of soup, and he was fasting, and, uh, and that's when the shots rang out. Immediately, the pastor wanted to jump up and go see what was going on. But the security guy said, stay here. Don't leave this room. And they, they took care of it. It is the initial feeling that you want to send your associate or probably in most cases, or yourself to see what's going on when you're hearing gunshots. But the best thing to do is let the security detail handle the situation. And, and, uh, and it was handled, in fact, he said later at a conference I was in in Louisiana, he said, Jack Haber got over me and, and he's a tall, lean, very profound guy, and he laid his hands on both my shoulders and said, I'm praying for the next 90 days you're going to need all the prayer you can get and I'm going to give you a prayer of wisdom and of peace and of tranquility because being the new pastor on the block and all of a sudden you have a shooting, he was the one that had to tell the parents their two girls were dead. You know, they took him to the hospital. After being on a retreat, the church sent him on a 30-day retreat to pray and uh, he felt like that he wanted to bring the pastor, I mean the shooter's parents from Denver down to the church 
and have them meet with the victim's parents and bring reconciliation. Felt like God told him that. And, but he wanted to get permission of the victim's parents first, so he did. And then he contacted the... See, the parents weren't the blame here. I'm not sure where blame goes, but I'd say the enemy. And, uh, but at the same time, reconciliation needs to happen in the, in, in the midst of travesty and sadness. And, and so he showed the parents of the shooter where their son died and was able to pray for him. Then we went up to their, his office and met with the victim's parents, and uh, they had a good cry, and they prayed, and, and they reconciled because they both felt guilt. The parents did. And uh, so, I mean, that's my little tidbit. Anyway, you're back on course, Larry. Just to flush this out just a little bit, uh, the first shooting at uh, the school was in Denver, and then that was late at night, and the second shooting at the church was in Colorado Springs, which I think is about 40, 40 minutes to an hour away. And so the lady, uh, she was a former police officer in Minnesota, when she heard on the radio the shooting at, uh, in Denver, I mean, you know, who, who touched her to say, I think I'm going to carry my gun today? And then he walks in and uh, they exchange gunfire with each other. This kid's uh, parents, his father was a neurosurgeon. I mean, they, they were like wealthy, wealthy folks. And uh, they, they, they lost him. Uh, Jim Atkinson, this is another one of these uh, kid functions at church. No adults around, nobody's watching what's going on, doors open. Uh, he walks in, doesn't belong to the church, doesn't have a kid. They had no dog in the fight, as far as we know. He walks in with a guitar case at a, ch at a church kid function. So that, that looks sort of normal, right? Except inside the guitar case was a shotgun, so it wasn't normal. So uh, he had wound up uh, killing two people and wounding uh, six others. Hate crime at church. Well, 2012... If you remember, this was up uh, in the suburb of Milwaukee. It's a Sikh temple. This guy, Wayne Page, went in there and uh, killed uh, six people. He had been to the church a couple weeks earlier, and he thought they were Muslim. He couldn't get it through his head that Sikhs and Muslims were different. Uh, but he, had, he was a white supremacist, and uh, this was his thing, and he went in there and killed six people. Obviously, Dylan Roof, the Charleston shooting. Um, they, they, let, they brought him in. They took him in, made him part of the Bible study, and then he wound up killing him. And I put this one in here for today because you came real close. I have no inside information, no divine uh, thought process in this thing, but you came really close. And, of course, right after the event that happened here, was the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. He hated Jews. So let me talk about targeted violence real quick. I'm going to just a few slides try to get in and talk about why these things happen. So what's targeted violence? It's defined as an intended violence, planned, premeditated on a specific target. It's a target. It's just not random. So you talk about assassinations. That's how this whole study stuff started with assassinations. And then you go to workplace, you go to schools, domestic, Church, they're all the same. It's targeted. It's targeted. The process doesn't occur in a vacuum. Violent acts, culmination of long developing identifiable trails of problems, conflicts, disputes, failures, anything like that. And these are the type of people that think that by attacking others, that's the way to solve their problem, and that's the scariest piece. One of the things I say in here all the time is like, you don't wake up today saying you're going to kill the president. You don't wake up today saying you're going to kill your principal or your pastor. It's a long process. Sometimes it might be pretty quick, you know, a few days, a week or something, but we've seen it where it goes on for a long, long time, months. It could turn into years. The research shows that these people are usually severely depressed, they have strong feelings of anger and resentment, they believe they're being persecuted and mistreated. They harbor resentments over rejection, social rejections. And they have a limited social disconnect, limited social network, which causes a disconnect. And what that is, is this right here. I'm disconnected. It's, I'm out. 
you can all think in your own lives how many times that, you know, you're all worked up over something and a friend, coworker, family member said, whoa, dude, take it easy, think about this, try to talk you down. No, you can't do this, wait a minute, maybe you should get help, maybe you should try something else. That's when you're connected, when you have somebody that's connected to you. But if you have nobody, if you have nobody, you're just all by yourself, and your plot process goes, I mean, we all know that you, sometimes that things get going in your head and they get like really carried away. If you don't have somebody to talk you down, you've got an issue, and that's what happens. So what this turns into is sort of the frustration aggression theory, and you became frustrated, and you're not connected. Nobody's trying to help you. Nobody, nobody's there to talk you down. And then you get angry, and that anger just starts spilling over. And then you get aggressive. It could start with a push. It could be like throwing a staple gun at work. It could be, uh, you know, a couple fisticuffs. And then the last piece is the rage. The violent uh, behavior equation that we used to talk about in the Secret Service is threefold, the person, the life setting, and then what was the trigger. And it's always tough to figure out what the trigger is. You don't know, because many times they take their own lives. And that, those three things will get you to that danger zone. So let's go back to, uh, that's Sutherland Springs. Now, what do we know about this kid, Devin? Kelly. He was a mess. He was discharged from the, the service for assaulting his new wife and newborn baby. He had been arrested for torturing a dog. I mean, he sort of sounds like a mess. He couldn't hold a job. Uh, he, he was a mess. He had, he had a, his life setting was bad. And then next, well, you know, what was, go, what was going on? Well, he's in a troubling marriage, and then the job's going bad on him. So what's the trigger? We don't really know. The official report out on this shooting from a year ago is not really out yet, but the guess is from people I've talked to is it was a domestic situation. He left the house that morning and he handcuffed his wife to a bed, and he took her phone, and he went to church, and he had an assault rifle and a black BDUs, you know, mask and uh, he was looking for his mother-in-law and he walked in and he knew the mother-in-law always sat on the right and he walked in and the first volley of shots went to the right the mother-in-law wasn't there the grandmother-in-law was there and she died in the shooting so when i say the report's not out yet one of these days we're going to find out there were probably text messages between the two between the mother-in-law and the shooter and that that's probably going to be the trigger we're talking about. All right, what have we learned? What are the things that we've learned from church violence? One, I've said it a million times, takes place after the service starts, meeting, activity, after it starts. You know, what are we doing? We're all looking up here, praying, thinking, singing, all the kind of stuff we do in church. We're looking this way, they're coming in the back. Number two, they enter from the back and they move to their target. In a domestic situation, they usually know where they're going. And other times they got to go searching around, like the kids I mentioned in San Francisco, up and down the aisle looking for their, their target. And then why enter from the rear? Well, surprise, target's lack of mobility, surrounding, and the people surrounding them are at the greatest risk. And I usually, this is going to say nothing more than a blue plastic gun, but if I come down here, sanctuary and the shooting starting because like I said they're not all going to be uh, uh, marksmen so you don't know who's coming through that door and they want that surprise and they know the target can't move around I mean look at where Wilbur's sitting he's just sitting between two men I mean you can't run real fast when you got to get around one or one or either one of them and here again this is sort of the example well, this church is full if that was your target and you walked up this aisle and you turned right here and start shooting, you know, you don't know what everybody's gonna do. Some people might play hero, some people are just gonna jump and run, some people will drop down, but somebody's gonna bump that guy with the gun. And uh, it don't take a whole lot for the bullets to go everywhere. Three, this is from a Secret Service study, a recent one, 
50% of the mass shooting study ended in five minutes. They're like real fast. Wham, bam, boom, five minutes. Usually takes the, half of them are over with before the police get here. Understandable, if they're done in five minutes, you know, it's, you, sometimes you get lucky and the police are right there, sometimes not. The other thing the service, Secret Service study said is that of these people, they had 27 of the subjects in this particular study, it showed that they were suffering a significant life stressor. What's a life stressor? Uh, I lost my job. Uh, it might be a mental illness thing. I might have some kind of a medical problem that's really tearing me up. My wife left. My kid died. I mean, it could be anything. They're suffering and they're looking to do something. 44% of them are white and over 50 years old. Actually, the shooter the other night was African American, wasn't he, Chuck? He was 60. Domestic violence, as we said before, a spillover into the church is a common problem. Uh, almost all the attackers planned out their attack in advance of carrying it out. I mentioned the, the Sikh temple shooting. This guy actually walked in and wanted to ask questions. Couldn't figure out what the difference between a Sikh and a Muslim, but he had a pretty good idea what it looked like when he walked inside that place. Where was the temple? Where was the different rooms, the hallways? Locking the door is a proven 100% countermeasure to active shooting. I have a pretty good uh, relationship with a, a group that's uh, made up of old retired uh, SWAT tactical officers. And they say that in a mass shooting, there's never been a solid locked door breached. Now, if you have a window in the top, like, a, like your classroom windows, and you can break the window and reach inside, yes, you can breach those. But looking at those two doors back there that you walk in, you can shoot through them. You, you could get hurt shooting through them, but you can't, you can't get in. They're going to move on down the road. So a locked, solid door has never been breached in a mass shooting. That's the point you don't hear much. The other thing about why you want to lock down the sanctuary, and I don't care if you're talking about the church or a school or your workplace or a mall, anything's happened. If you lock down, you cut the panic out. If you're all running out the door, as a, one or two officers are trying to run in to take care of business, it, it just doesn't work. You know, they have their tactics, it's a diamond or a square, I mean, you can see them in there. Uh, they have their tactic to move through here, and the best thing is they don't have a flock of people running at them, because they don't know who's running at them or not. Last thing is, if it's predictable, it's preventable. Follow me on this one. The first guy here, we talked about him, that was the cutter, remember? He's cutting his elbow, rubbing the blood on the door, that's a clue. Something's wrong. We should have thought there was something wrong there. And you should have thought that maybe he was going to come to church the next day. And he did. Thankfully, he didn't have a real gun. Second guy, they told the minister before service started, James is coming with a gun. We didn't do anything. Third guy, I mean, when you start mailing threatening letters, and then you start putting live ammunition in the letters, and then you start sh shooting pepper spray through the mailbox, there's something wrong. Now they finally, with the help of some surveillance cameras, figured this out, but what I'm saying is if you can predict or if you think something's gonna happen, take the next step and prevent it. Uh, I'm gonna go right back here. This guy here, I'm gonna tell you the story about him. He, uh, it's, an old Sp it's an old Spanish uh, church uh, that's in Miami and uh, like on Tuesday, uh, they have a l very large lighted sign outside so announcing kind of an event or whatever. So uh, Wednesday morning they come in and someone absolutely destroyed the sign. A couple thousand dollar sign, just, just in pieces. Okay, that's number one. On Thursday they come in and this statue is 500 years old. They come in on Thursday and the head's gone. Head's laying at the base. After his arrest, they find that on his Facebook page. But what he did is on Sunday, he did come to church, just like the cutter. He showed up at church, and he was going to cause a disruption, and he jumped up saying he was going to kill everybody. He did not have a weapon. But guess what? The police were there. It wasn't a big deal. And I'm going to play just a quick video, real fast, uh, from the minister of the church that day talking about you know, what he thought was coming. 
once this man made threats, of course, our immediate concern was about the safety of the people in the congregation. Um, we did not anticipate he was going to come back and vandalize the statue. Uh, we thought it had to do with the, the church services. Um, so our main concern was not about property, but about people. We were able to have police coverage here, and we were ready for them. There were police at the front gate, police in the gardens, police behind the Sunday school room in case he would have chosen a rear entrance. So we would feel very good about the fact that we got coverage and that people were here. If it's predictable, it's preventable. If you think you have a problem, try to make some arrangements to take care of it. Okay, I'll let you know that I've, uh, hold on. I did my piece in one hour. I planned these out for one hour. What I can't plan for is the interrupter. So if anybody is sitting there shaking because they got to go to the restroom, it's time. We're going to take like a 10, huh? 15 minute break. Finish off the donuts, y'all non-fasters. Go to the bathroom, come back in 15. Uh, so let's be back here 10 till. We want to finish on time. And, and let, me, let me just uh, make mention. I'm a minister. I wouldn't be a minister if I didn't have a product, right? I have a book I wrote called Dead Men Rising. It's a very uh, anecdotal stories about the men's movement in today's times and uh, my career in the Secret Service. And also a book of uh, how to plan and, and function a, a creative men's ministry in a church as well as a full armor of God coin. A full armor of God coin, I, I, I sell the, I, I, this helps my ministry travels internationally, but uh, they are, the whole package is, ten, is $20. Coins are 10, the books are 10. Uh, but they're available out here in the lobby. And the full armor of God coin is, what I found is we need to pray the full armor of God on every morning. You know, when you go to bed at night, you take your clothes off, right? You don't leave it on. Well, the armor gets loose during the night. So what I challenge men and women is pray on the full armor of God in the morning. And this coin is a reminder when you get up, when you're putting your money in your pocket, what's left, Wilbur. And, uh, and uh, it's a reminder to pray on the full armor of God for you and your family. So I'll be in the back back there if you have questions or whatever, or if you're interested in looking at these books.